Hello, welcome everyone. We are just going to give folks um, a few minutes to, or a minute to, um, to join us, and we will we will get started very shortly. So, welcome to the Understanding Efficiency webinar. Okay, great. Well, we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, welcome, everyone, to the first of three of a three-part series based on the handbook Underwriting Efficiency. Just a few housekeeping items to start off with. Um, you should all be able to see on your right hand, the right hand side of your screen, um, a header called the Handouts, and right underneath that is the Underwriting Efficiency Handbook. Um, it's available there so that you are able to download that, that PDF document. Um, also, as we go through the webinar, please feel free to insert your questions and comments in the chat box, and we will be calling on those throughout the, the webinar. And um, lastly, just to let folks know, we will be recording today's session, so we will make, it, make that available to you. Um, after this webinar has ended. And I'd like to start the webinar with a quick poll of the group that we're going to put up on the screen. And if folks could just take a, a few seconds to fill that out. And we'll come back to that uh, a little later. Okay, so we'll wrap that up. So here's here are the responses from that. Thanks for participating. How knowledgeable are you about the topic of today's webinar? So we've got a really nice range here of some folks that are um, very new to this topic, some that uh, uh, have professional expertise, and then I think a, a good slice in the middle that have that understand the key concepts related to this topic, but hopefully we'll all learn a little bit more here today. So my name is Yerina Mujica. Um, I'm the Managing Director of the Center for Market Innovation at the Natural Resources Defense Council, and I will be moderating today's webinar. Um, if we could ex just advance the slide. We're joined today by Elizabeth Kelly, Manager of Sustainability Programs at the Community Preservation Corporation, and Robert Riggs, Senior Vice President um, and Regional Director for New York City at CPC as well. So just a little bit of background I wanted to, to start with. Um, I work as part of a coalition called Energy Efficiency for All, which is a partnership among NRDC, the National Housing Trust, Elevate Energy, and the Energy Foundation. And Energy Efficiency for All works on the ground in 12 states across the country to increase energy efficiency in affordable multifamily housing. 
one part of this work is to support strategies that align energy efficiency resources with the financing process of affordable housing properties. So as part of this effort, we have brought together a network of community development financial institutions that focus on affordable housing to share what has worked and explore opportunities for expanding and employing that knowledge. The advisory committee for this CDFI Learning Network includes Community Investment Corporation, Elevate Energy, Enterprise, Community Partners, National Housing Trust, LISC, the Natural Resources Defense Council, and our presenters today, Community Preservation Corporation. Over the next year, this network will be developing a suite of resources, including a website with a resource hub to provide access to case studies, best practice guides, and other helpful information for practitioners. We'll also be developing a transaction database that will provide a reference point for efficiency financing transactions. And lastly, um, this webinar series, which we are excited to launch today with CPC, and we look forward to um, having this be the first of a series of, web of similar webinars. So I will now turn it over to Elizabeth at CPC to talk about the handbook they developed in, on underwriting efficiency. Thanks, Marina. Um, this is Elizabeth Kelly. I manage the sustainability programs here at the Community Preservation Corporation, or CPC. I'm joined today um, by Robert Riggs, sitting right next to me. What do you do here, Robert? Um, I'm the regional director for New York City Lending, uh, primarily doing construction lending for uh, the construction or renovation of multifamily stock in the five boroughs. So um, for those of you who aren't familiar with CPC, um, we're a nonprofit affordable housing and neighborhood revitalization lender and CDFI. So we were founded in 1974 to address the renovation needs of aging and deteriorating multifamily housing stock um, throughout New York City's neighborhoods. Um, as Robert alluded to, we provide construction and permanent financing to owners of multifamily buildings in low and moderate income neighborhoods, um, really focus on preserving existing buildings as well as um, providing financing for the new construction of affordable rental housing. Uh, although our start was in New York City, we now work throughout New York State and over our 40 plus year history, we have worked to preserve or create over 157,000 units of affordable housing, been really involved in downtown revitalizations throughout the state, um, and continue to push for kind of improved building quality as well as energy efficiency as part of, of our mission and, and the work that we do throughout the communities. So why energy efficiency and why now? Um, CPC has um, put a lot of thought and we're very passionate and kind of engrossed in the nexus of how energy efficiency impacts uh, multifamily buildings, especially affordable housing. Um, what we see and what we say on our soapbox is that the cost savings associated with energy and water efficiency are it's simply just critical to the long-term financial stability and preservation of affordable rents. Uh, efficient buildings not only provide a host of the long-term benefits, um, but these are benefits for investors, for tenants, for the environment, um, while also cutting down on fossil fuel consumption and, and costs in the building. It, the graph that you see on your screen um, is a look at an annual expense breakdown that we typically see from multifamily building owners in our portfolio. And we found that on average, 30% of an uh, annual budget is spent on utilities. And while most of the other expenses, kind of in the dark blue, um, in the dark blue wedge, include things that are fixed, like legal fees, cleaning, and maintenance, and other non-negotiable items like real estate taxes. The utility wedge of this pie presents a great opportunity um, to lower expenses. Other costs are fixed. Utilities can be decreased, um, and we can improve cash flow and therefore the economics of the buildings that we're financing. So 
first kind of takeaway today is that utilities is equals opportunity. You have an opportunity to improve, um, improve the property holistically by looking at utilities where there might not be a lot of other wiggle room. Um, so given um, the influence that lenders can have on the economics and the condition of multifamily buildings and buildings in general, uh, we see that the lending industry has a great opportunity to promote the incorporation of energy measures at the time of refinancing or acquisition. Um, so we put together a handbook to kind of share some of our best practices that we've been using here at CPC since about, well, almost 10 years now. Um, some trial and error, so we wanted to kind of cut through that for the rest of our partners, especially in the CDFI world. And again, share best practices, what works, what doesn't, and really break it down. Um, you know, we um, put together the handbook and are coupling it with this training series, which you're participating in, to, as I said, share the best practices, but also provide professionals that are involved in origination, underwriting, closing, servicing, just all aspects of multifamily mortgage finance, the information and the tools uh, necessary to kind of take that step and start thinking about energy efficiency as a critical part of building refinance. Um, the handbook is broken out into three sections. Uh, first, the section one is understanding efficiency, and that's really today's webinar topic. We're going to be talking, just getting more familiar with efficiency, especially from a lender's um, perspective. There's a lot of talk, even subway ads, there's just stuff all over about how building owners, homeowners, residents can save money, but we wanted to flip that and put it on how can the lender think about this and how is it in the lender's best interest to make sure this is happening um, for their customer and for their owners. Um, second section is building efficiency, where we really get into what does efficiency look like. I'm new to this topic. I don't know what you mean, Elizabeth, when you're saying energy efficiency. So if that's you, join on November 8th. 3 p.m., same time, same people. Well, Robert won't be here, but more people. And we're going to really talk about what does efficiency look like in a multifamily building um, and how do we incorporate that into financing. And then the third webinar is integrating efficiency, which I'm really excited about. And that walks through um, a kind of phased plan from originations all the way through construction monitoring and asset management and loan servicing and kind of points out different tips and tools along the way to not only make sure these projects are happening and starting conversations on the topic with our customers and with our investors and our board members, but also making sure that we're tracking and quantifying and recording the impacts and all that great stuff. Um, as Yurina mentioned, this handbook, there is a link um, on your panel. It says handouts, and I believe there's like a download for the handbook, so you can Pull that if you want. You can go to our website, communityp.com, and download it from, from there, um, or email us. Our contact information is at the end, and we'll send it to you. You don't need it for this handbook, I mean, for this webinar, but there's a lot of information in there. Um, and, you know, this is kind of just like the amuse bouche for the handbook. It's just to kind of, it's interesting. <laughs> Let's stop there. Um, okay, so what if you're on this call and you're not a lender? Um, what if you're a building owner or you're on the policy side, you work for an NGO and you're interested in this, um, but you're like, oh, maybe this is too lending specific? Well, you can stay online because most of the economic and social principles that we're going to be discussing for the rest of the presentation can be applied to a large range of investment and lending activities, especially projects that are focusing on that triple bottom line, which is projects that seek both equitable environmental gains in addition to economics. So hope you stay with us. So Robert, being quiet over there, true or false, property owners have the greatest access to capital when they obtain their first mortgages. Um, so it is true that first mortgage financing is the, kind of the cheapest uh, and most flexible access to capital because 
Right. So if you're doing the energy improvements of any kind, there are there is a cost associated with them, whether it's balanced against savings or not. It is it amounts to an investment in the building at some scale, and it really only there are only three sources uh, for that capital investment. You know, equity, debt, or subsidy. So you know, owners might choose to just pay for improvements out of pocket. It, it might be a reasonable business for, decision for them to do that, but by definition, you know, that's equity. Uh, that's the most expensive form of capital. So if they're really doing a cost-benefit analysis, they would rather um, have less expensive capital. Um, there's a thought that, well, you know, the best way to do this is to give somebody second mortgage financing for um, just for the energy improvements, if that seems cleaner. Uh, but that means it's subordinate financing, which probably means it's more expensive um, than first mortgage financing. It also means that the the first mortgage lender who might already be in place has to agree to the subordinate financing, which can make what seems like a simple process uh, much more complicated. Um, and then finally, it could be subsidy. <clears throat> so subsidy is very inexpensive, uh, you know, uh, by definition, but it's a very limited resource. You know, it's not necessarily scalable. And in all likelihood, if it comes with any kind of lien position, you again got to go back to the first mortgage finance, the first mortgage lender for approval. So. Um, even if you're using subsidy, you probably want to put it in, in an ideal world, you put it in with the first mortgage financing because the first mortgage financing is the cheapest, most flexible uh, uh, source of capital. Yeah, and I really would stress that, so this is great capital to use. You're already kind of opening the building up financially or physically um, and, you know, this is really just a simple add-on to be in, I don't even like saying add-on, you can integrate the efficiency scope into this refinance package, lock in that low cost capital, um, and not only does the borrower benefit from kind of the lower expenses, improved property condition, better cash flow, but there's definitely benefits for uh, the lender institutionally um, and I think that having these early conversations when they're first coming in the door um, really helps to lock in that value of energy efficiency as, and incorporating it in part of this process, uh, existing process, the wheels are already there, things are already turning to create a, a situation that benefits both the lenders and the owners. Um, I think that when you talk about energy efficiency, there's this like weighted conversation about the value of efficiency. What's the payback on every single little measure that you're putting in, and how can we quantify it, and how can we justify upping, you know, re, re um, insulating all of the heating systems, and it needs to have like a, a energy savings. Um, dollar sign next to every single measure, but Robert, I think there's a lot of precedent out there for other kinds of things that we've done in billions over time where they've improved finances, they've re reduced risk on our side, kind of benefit both sides of the table, and energy efficiency is kind of part of that, just like back kind of in the olden, olden, <laughs> the olden days. Robert wasn't here in the olden days, but when we first started, we were doing these gut rehabs in, um, you know, northern Manhattan and really like tightening up, replacing copper wiring and solving for leaks and saving money and. So you know, so I concur, and uh, you know, and I would, I would, I'm going to say the same thing in kind of a different way. It's so like set aside energy efficiency for a minute. Um, Mortgage financing, particularly first mortgage financing or refinancing, is a decision point uh, in the life of a building and in the relationship between the building and its owner. Um, and I would think of it, it's a point where the owner is bringing the building to market, to the debt market. Uh, in the interim, the owner is operating the building. He may be well informed. He may not be well informed. He may have a, a clear idea of the, of the value of the asset. He may not. But when he he finances, he takes the building to the debt market and says, you know, this is my building, here are its finances, here's the physical inspection, and the, the, the lender confirms or challenges his assumptions about value. Um, and if he's speaking to more than one lender, which he probably is, he's probably getting multiple opinions. Um, 
if he's actually selling the building or there's someone acquiring the building, there's even an, another party involved and everybody uh, is kind of in a market collaboration to determine uh, you know, what's the value of the building. Right? So in that process, there's a back and forth always between, well, what are your operating costs? You know, what, how much do you pay for management? What kind of shape is your roof in? What kind of shape you know, is, the, are, are the, is the electrical system in? That's all completely, that's a completely normal part of evaluating the building and someone's saying, well, you know, you could be operating for this or, you know, that your operations are awfully tight on that and, um, you know, the, the willingness of the market to provide debt is a confirmation, you know, of the value. But it always, it, it's, tip, it's not uncommon at all for it to come with requirements like, well, okay, this is fine, but you've got to fix the sidewalk, you know, if you've got to fix the, the, the you know, the roof. Um, so to add as a component in that um, energy efficiency is is completely appropriate and and I think as Elizabeth was saying that the kind of mechanism is there for the evaluation so to add another layer isn't you know isn't something that's going to be rejected in the sense that they're already you know, they're already doing inspections and reports you're already making requirements and recommendations that's true in a straight refinance it's especially true in a renovation loan or a loan that's funding capital, significant capital improvements. Because in that case, there's the asset that everybody's evaluating, but you're about to you know, invest in the asset and improve it. And you know, we would routinely uh, underwrite, you know, the reason you need a new boiler uh, or a new roof is that the existing system is, is inadequate uh, and it's affecting your expenses and expecting the tenant's experience in the building and it's, it's, it's impacting the owner's uh, perception of value and the market's perception of value so it needs to be fixed and it's going to change the asset into a different asset modestly improving it um, so there's no reason it's completely consistent to begin to also talk about energy efficiency at the same time so we're going to just keep unpacking kind of this relationship between the borrower and lender and the benefits to both of those stakeholders um, and we're going to start this section with some level setting, and these are the things that we need to kind of focus on and just get out of the way. What on earth is energy efficiency? Are the savings real? How does efficiency increase cash flow? What role does the lender play, which we touched on a little bit, and then how does the customer benefit? So yes, the savings are real. I, you've heard, heard it here. Um, a study by the ACEEE came back and said that multifamily buildings can cost effectively reduce annual energy bills by 15 to 30 percent, and we see that water um, an inc you know a reduction of 50, 15 to 50 percent. I think this fluctuates depending on how big of how um, high the bills were in the building initially. Um, bigger hogs have more to save. Um, so there's that, but these are, you know, something 15, 20% savings are very, um, you know, very standard now for a, you know, a thorough but not aggressive energy retrofit. Okay, second. So what is energy efficiency? Um, so I say efficiency a lot, and that is just a short abbreviation for things that are, for measures and or processes that are going to lower properties' utility bills, limit the consumption of fossil fuels, conserve electricity or water, or add renewable energy generation, something like solar photovoltaics or, or wind power. Um, in the handbook, we have a whole list of different kind of energy efficiency measures. Here is a sample of that. Um, if you want to see more, you can reference the handbook in section 2, pages 7 through 14, and we break this down um, and provide kind of a sample scope um, for three different examples. Uh, a simple upgrade and kind of a list to do at a at refinance, I think that's what this one is up on the screen. Number two, a moderate renovation, so a little bit more expanded scope, um, and then substantial improvements, which include suggested measures that fit with both more like a gut rehab or new construction. So if you're if you want to improve your vernacular on what is energy efficiency and water conservation measures, you can check that out because we have a whole list of them. Um, and we also talk about the cost and, and the savings associated with those measures. 
Um, so how does energy efficiency increase cash flow? Um, in the graphic you see here, there's two scenarios. And in example A, we have business as usual for an affordable housing building, seeking a loan, and public subsidy. Um, income is the green circle minus utilities in orange and other expenses equals NOI or net operating income. Um, it's from the NOI that a lender, as most of you must know, is the lender calculates this affordable loan. And here it's paired with some um, subsidy um, for the full package to embark on this renovation. In example B, the green income circle stays the same and the orange pie representing utilities decreases, presumably due to energy efficiency. So now you can see that NOI increases, and with a higher, high, more income and a higher NOI, there's additional cash flow, and the building can support additional loan proceeds. So um, those additional loan proceeds, I think, if I, yeah, so here, we're down here, additional loan proceeds. So you have, it can do a couple things, and this is a very rudimentary graphic to kind of get to just the nuts and bolts of this, but you can take on more private debt, which means you can pay for additional measures, you can cover that maybe weren't included in the scope of work, you can reduce the amount of public subsidy, um, you could add additional features to the project, um, I think We'd like to see it going to more and more energy efficient and high performance um, equipment. Um, but by kind of thinking through underwriting in this way and really capturing the cost savings as part of underwriting and understanding how it will affect NOI and therefore the supportable loan amount, you're at a point of conversation where you can really start to incentivize your customer or your owner to, to act and, and show a clear path to financing um, this type of work. So um, this is a pretty simple example that we use to illustrate the economic case, but Robert, can we talk to how you see this kind of fleshing out in, in the real world? So you know, when we underwrite a construction loan for capital improvements, we use a set of standard um, operating expenses that include utilities. And that's based on an annual survey we do of all the buildings that we service in our portfolio. And any lender is going to have some pool of data like that that they rely on. So when you look at our annual survey, you see a couple of things. Over time, you see the cost of utilities fluctuates dramatically with the cost of fuel. You know, so recent declines in natural gas costs in New York City has a real impact on what it costs to operate buildings. When more buildings were on oil and oil was very expensive or spiked or the price collapsed, you see a direct impact on operations and net operating income. So over time, you see that this, this piece of the operating budget is really variable. And then in a given year, when you look across our portfolio, you see real kind of a, a factor of, you see that there are efficient buildings and inefficient buildings, even in the same building type. And that it's not that an inefficient building is slightly less efficient. It can be, we see a factor of five actually across between an efficient building in our uh, portfolio and an inexpensive building in our portfolio, you know, which big begs the question. So we're, we're taking an average or an average plus 10%, you know, to say, well, this is what you should be able to operate at in this hypothetical future for this particular building. If we could get comfortable being higher up in that distribution and, you know, towards more efficiency, you know, it results in more NOI and more, you know, this, this diagram, the, it supports this diagram on the slide. And the reason that that's so important is that, you know, that, that NOI creates a, is, part, is a critical part of a pool of resources that is going to be used to complete this development. That's true for a affordable deal. It's also true for a market rate deal. Um, and if you if you have more resources uh, to fund renovation in particular, uh, you know, you can, uh, that's what any, that's what the seat that any, the position that any developer wants to be in. So, um, yeah, but tell us more about kind of the reaction from customers for using this kind of methodology. Wouldn't people prefer just having the cash in their pocket? How do you kind of account for that? Well, so again, resources, you know, are, are scarce in any development project. Um, so to take the NOI, just put it on your pocket, 
in your pocket means that um, you're putting more equity. All other things being equal, you're, you're either putting more deck equity into the project or you're putting more subsidy into the project. Uh, subsidy is a very scarce resource uh, and is guarded by the subsidy providers. And you're always going to be a better position with them if you can show a reduction in subsidy. And then equity is all is an expensive resource. So um, if you can, I mean, the goal, the whole point of real estate finance in a market situation or a sub, uh, subsidized situation is to leverage debt and minimize equity. Uh, so you know, it's uh, it's not a heavy lift if you, if you can get to the point of you've you've quantified the savings. We have, we're going to talk about that in future. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, future webinars, but if you can quantify the savings and then make some risk assumptions about how you're going to treat those savings, um, you know, we've not seen, uh, uh, owners are happy to leverage more first mortgage debt uh, in almost every, every scenario. And then the only other thing I'd say is there is a balancing, you know, that, that the owner is, the, the lender is more risk averse than the owner. And so, you know, and the, again, this will come up in the underwriting sessions. Uh, some of that we're not going to count. We're not going to rely on all that savings because it has not been demonstrated yet. So we're when we take our kind of fudge factor or credit adjustment, it means that if um, the savings are really realized, it actually will increase the NOI to the borrower. Um, so so you know this wedge is a twenty percent reduction, and we're saying okay, we're going to count ten or twelve percent of that. Mm -hmm. uh, it means that if they actually hit, it means we're safe because there's a there's a, another eight percent cushion. But it means if he hits the eight percent cushion. Uh, he that's money in his pocket. So our, I would say it's an, in, it's an instance where the, the interests of the lender and the owner are in alignment, and I would include the subsidy provider in that way, in that as well, to the extension that uh, increased NOI and increased private debt reduced the pressure on the subsidy provider. And that's like that. Everyone wins. So um, what role can a lender play? Um, I think the first and foremost is just educating the bar borrowers about the benefits of efficiency and starting that conversation as you know early in the application process. And that can be as simple as just saying, hey, have you considered doing any efficiency as part of this refinance? And if the answer is no and they haven't thought about that, you have a great opportunity to say, oh, here's a list of recommended measures or, you know, here's some you know, I've seen in other similar projects. And it's just about, you know, starting that conversation. I don't think these conversations are really happening yet across the industry. And just taking that step forward kind of puts into this, um, you know, into a ripple effect that just creates more and more opportunity. Um, the borrowers can also work to help identify opportunities. I think a great time for that is doing, during your walkthrough, when you're visiting the site, and kind of pointing out, um, you know, like, oh, you're replacing that boiler. What are you replacing it with? If it's, you know, in, in kind, or is this a chance where you can really go above and beyond? Um, again, well, financing the upgrades and improvements with mortgage capital, which is kind of what this presentation is all about. Um, and underwriting the savings, providing the additional loan proceeds to finance the improvements, and then connecting borrowers um, to private and public incentive programs. And I think, um, you know, not every bank that you go to is obviously going to take this position and have this role and relationship with their customers, but I think the CDFI community in particular, you know, has a great, there's a great opportunity there for this community. Um, I think we do a lot of technical assistance uh, and it fits really nicely into that, um, into that offering. Um, well, so, and of course, how does the customer benefit? Um, there are Significant benefits. I think what we've talked about is the access to low cost long term capital, cheap money, cash can be queen, but debt is or king, but debt's pretty good too, as Roberts explained. 
Um, there's opportunities to provide better loan terms, whether that's additional loan proceeds. Um, also, um, Freddie Mac through their Green Advantage program and Fannie Mae's Green Rewards program incentivize energy efficiency with an interest rate reduction. I'm sure there's many other kind of financial um, in ways to incentivize these products financially. These are kind of two of the most popular ones right now. Um, and then you marketability and retention. You know, energy efficiency is reducing these costs, improving comfort, improving health, lowering vacancy, um, keeping people happy and um, in affordable homes um, where they're comfortable can really bump up both well, retention, but then also it's a great thing to sell that the customers or, or I guess you'd say renters are really looking for right now. We're going to take a little break right now in case anybody had any questions, anybody out there and they wanted to um, put a question about this um, into the chat box. Okay, well while that's happening, we're going to move ahead and kind of walk through a quick case study. Um, the location in New York City, so this is an 18 unit multifamily rental building. There's a rehab scope of half a million dollars. There's efficiency work, $45,000, um, and projected energy savings, 40%. Um, oh. <laughs> Okay, so we start with the historicals, um, start with annual income. Um, this is an underwriting case study, so we're going to walk through the underwriting. So income minus expenses, so we're subtracting the annual expenses, which includes utility costs as well as all the other expenses the building has, such as um, salaries, insurance, taxes. And income minus expenses equals NOI or net operating income. Um, from that, we can determine the loan amount and the amount of debt service, and we can calculate um, the debt service coverage ratio, assume the property value, as well as, of course, the loan to value. So this is all the, the historical building as usual um, um, cash flow. Okay, so here we have our energy efficiency example. Income is staying the same, um, but efficiency, work doing efficiency is lowering expenses. Um, we are cutting the expenses just by 20% to make this example a little bit more consumable. 20% um, on the 40% projection, so we're right. taking half. So we're taking half, and so that's the kind of fudge factor that we were talking about earlier. It's just a cushion and also an opportunity for you know, both parties to get benefit. There's additional loan proceeds, but you also have, you know, it's not all of your savings are going to pay back debt service. Um, and other expenses are staying the same. And we see NOI has, is increasing, and the project can support additional debt. So the loan value goes up, property value increases. Um, but in this scenario, we've modeled it out make sure, to make sure that loan value and debt service coverage remain the same. So at the end of this example, you have additional loan proceeds, $91,000 and an additional $5,000 per unit. Um, if we go back to this slide, you can see, so our cost of the efficiency scope was $45,000. Additional loan proceeds, 91. This definitely covers the work of that. Maybe some consultants that you had to hire to do the kind of analysis to produce the efficiency scope. But definitely um, there's financing, there's funds available to, to do this. And just I would add that it's not, you know, that's not a normal dynamic oftentimes when you're saying we want you to do this. And then there's no, you know, this luck, this kind of cost benefit can be tedious to work through you know, in normal conversation with a borrower, at least you have the opportunity to do it, as opposed to saying, you know, you've got to put in this kind of window, uh, and you just, you know, and that's that's the requirement uh, with no, you know, it improves the value of the building, but you can't turn it into the cash flow to pay for the window. Right. 
Um, okay, so again, if you have any questions, you can add them to the chat, um, and we'll be happy to answer them. And but now I'm going to take it kind of high level again. Um, this is our kind of efficiency you know, benefits diagram, um, and I definitely wanted to spend some time talking about this. Um, it's a lot of information, but when you're selling efficiency to the customer, whether well, whether it's your customer, your board, your coworkers, your managers, your investors, your public partners, um, efficiency can be the answer to many of the challenges um, we as professionals face in the real estate industry. And I think the things that really you know, drive someone to, to renovate a building, to make improvements, are going to be, you know, seeking financial stability, tenant satisfaction, and improved property condition. And efficiency can really um, impact all of those, positively impact them. Um, these terms, these three terms, we actually tested with an industry focus group, and the words have really resonated with the participants. Um, and it's clear that this is where our focus is in the industry. So we wanted to expand, you know, specifically on these concepts that I think the industry is really motivated by, and use them to kind of further spell out the benefits of efficiency and efficient how efficient yeah, so many efficiencies and how efficiency works to strengthen the the triple bottom line. So we have you know financial stability, the first one. Um, contributing to a building's financial stability, um, we can invest in efficiency, which can raise the NOI, lower vacancy, improve value, a reduction in expenses, and an increase in cash flow improves the building's financial performance, which also translates into portfolio performance when efficiency is integrated across lending products and investments. Um, combined healthier property economics work together to lower the risk of loan delinquency. Efficiency as a tool for risk mitigation hasn't really been discussed very much, um, but as an industry, I think we need to kind of move beyond thinking of efficiency as new and that efficiency is the risk, and instead that it can actually solve for risk. If you're interested in learning or thinking more about that, Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratories in um, partnership with the Department of Energy just put out a study about, it's called Energy Factors in Commercial Mortgages. Um, so check that out if, if you don't believe me. Um, tenant satisfaction uh, and boosting equity, um, and equity not as in the dollar sense, the debt equity is in the social equity uh, in the buildings that we finance, I think drives a lot of CDFIs to do their work. Um, and depending on what circles you run in, you've either heard a lot about how energy efficiency impacts key metrics like affordability, comfort, and health, or this is all very new to you. Um, as you know, common area and owner paid expenses shrink costs for the borrower, Utility costs of residents will also decline through efficiency, thereby you know, they'll, that'll reduce the all-in cost of housing um, and improve long-term term affordability and housing security qualitatively. Um, we see measures like modernizing a building's ventilation and air sealing, or moderate, modernizing a building's ventilation and also doing something called air sealing, which prevents conditioned air, odors, and pests from moving around the building. You know, these types of measures improve air quality and lower exposure to allergens, reduces temperature fluctuations, improves resident health, comfort, and livability, and also lowers complaints. So win-win. And the last piece, um, but last but not least, uh, I think, um, is stewardship. Yes, you know, ultimately we, we're probably talking about a green building and um, usually you might expect us to kind of lead with stewardship and efficiency and how all of this reduces fossil fuels, but we really wanted to save it to the end um, because there's so many other factors that are working together to kind of improve um, this 
project, but at the end of the day, your physical the physical quality of the building has improved, safety's improved, you've um, improved resiliency both financial and possibly on a physical level, um, and then you are reducing the amount of fossil fuel and energy used in this project or in this property, reducing the amount of carbon dioxide, greenhouse gas emissions, and other um, pollutants in the atmosphere. So this all kind of comes together in this lovely chart. Um, but if you're ever, if you're out and you're talking about energy efficiency and trying to sell it to one of the stakeholders or um, get a borrower to, you know, install X, Y, or Z, you know, kind of coming back to this chart and the talking points that we've laid out here, I think can be really, really helpful um, when having those, those conversations. Um, Okay, so, so we have some questions. Can, Elizabeth, would it be helpful for, for me to um, read some of these questions that we're getting in? Yeah, I think we're ready for some questions now. Great, and folks, please um, feel free to, to continue to add questions through the chat feature. Um, the first question is, can you clarify why CPC underwrites to a percentage of savings? How did CPC decide how much to downgrade the savings? So I'll speak to that. Um, so you know we're involved in a process of integrating this into our underwriting. Um, so there's our underwriting. We also have partners. We have uh, a mortgage insurer who insures most of our pri our permanent mortgages. Uh, we have investors that buy a subset of our permanent mortgages. We have appraisers and engineers that we have to work with, and we are getting reports that project and quant that quantify projected savings. So that is a you know a look into the future on an asset that hasn't been built yet. Um, so our from a credit perspective, there's risk there, uh, and the appropriate first step uh, into that that risk is to mitigate it uh, with a discount to the projected savings. So that is, that's a step in a process that will, the next steps will be starting to collect performance data on buildings that have uh, met certain scope, uh, have included certain scope uh, and spec in their, in their renovation budget. And as we accumulate data uh, in, you know, of actual performance as opposed to projected performance, our expectation is our expectation is that our, our mitigant was conservative and that we are over correcting and that as we as we build a pool of data uh, that supports a less aggressive mitigant we will um, adjust the mitigant down and take you know less and less discount on the projected savings into an ideal situation where we would be able to to accept the projected savings as long 100 percent of it as long as it's consistent with uh, recently renovated buildings in our portfolios, actual data. Um, so the data is important, and every every loan that we do now, uh, the borrower agrees in the loan documents um, to give us access to their uh, well, uh, all their operating data. They've always given us, but now they're specifically their energy data in a format uh, that and a, and level of detail that lets us um, begin to build the data pool that will let us soften that discount. Yeah, we're being able to look at usage as well as cost too with the information that we're that we're providing. And it's not that we don't don't believe that there's a hundred percent of the savings that could happen. It's just this is kind of the approach that we've taken in this frontier stage of this of this work. Um, so the second question is asking if CPC requires or performs energy and water audits as part of our financing and do we re or do we require this? And so I think like a lot of lenders, we have a whole bunch of different loan products and so everything kind of changes depending on the on the product. Um, we have a lot of our new construction and rehabilitation um, for affordable housing in New York City and New York State do require an IPNA, an Integrated Physical Needs Assessment, which is kind of a combination of, oh, I don't want to misquote this, but it's like an ASHRAE Level 2 audit um, with some 
changes. If you're not familiar with it, um, NRDC has actually done a lot of work helping to develop this tool, and so we use it um, as a way to identify what measures are going to be um, included in, in the scope of work, as well as um, a document from a third party that projects what the, what the future energy costs are going to be. And so I'll speak to our experience with that as a lender too. So, you know, I oversee a staff of people who, you know, are committed to affordability and committed to improving the housing stock and they're great people, but they also have, you know, production goals, they want to close transactions. And so you were introducing, okay, look, you got to, this is a new dimension to the underwriting and you got to get this additional report. Um, and we're dealing with borrowers who I have the same commitments, but also want to get the transaction done. So there's pushback, right? So. About 75% of the construction lending we do in the five boroughs does have subsidy. The subsidy comes with the requirement for the IP&A or an equivalent. So that's a real luxury for us as a private lender because somebody else is the bad guy. <laughs> they produce the, the report. It's just a cost of doing business on those transactions. And then we say, look, this is not just a piece of paper that's going to go in a file. We're actually going to use this to generate more resources for the project. So that's like good. And that's my staff of underwriters has you know, the luxury of doing those transactions. When we're doing unsubsidized transactions with private borrowers, we do not require uh, that level of energy review. But what the staff, including myself, have learned is that you, know, you can do, you can take the normal um, engineering review and you can look at their expenses uh, historically and you can say, you know, you're, this building is very inefficient, if it is inefficient. And you, we've had enough experience to say, uh, you know, with the reports and with the scope items to say, look, uh, and have a real uh, conversation with a private owner who might not be inclined to do this to say, this is what your, you know, your gas bill was in the last three years. You know, this is what we think it could be based on our experience with other projects. And this is what it would do, you know, to the debt you can raise. And, you, and this is what we think it would cost. And so our experience, you know, with the, with the audits, uh, that were forced on the transactions by the subsidy provider has actually armed us well and incentivized us to have that conversation with private borrowers when it's uh, when it's appropriate uh, and it's been I think uh, a very a productive dynamic. Um, there's a question here about what steps that we take to ensure that the savings materialize. materialize. And if we get involved in quality assurance of vendor installations or vendor selection, I think that's always been an interesting area for a lender to participate in is you know, vendor selection and quality assurance or you know, performance guarantees. Um, we will definitely be talking more about this in the session that's coming up. At the well, it's about a month away now. On November 29th, where we're talking about integrating efficiency into our process, where um, we go through some best practices for loan servicers, legal team, uh, as well as construction monitors, to make sure that everybody at the lending institution is kind of aware of this, um, aware of the efficiency. We also do the benchmarking like we already talked about, which helps us to definitely track savings and make sure that savings are realized. I think having that requirement um, really helps to mitigate fear that if, you know, if something wasn't properly installed, we'll know about it very soon once the building's operating and we can commission it um, immediately. Um, do does CPC have energy efficiency standards, kind of like a checklist of um, energy efficiency measures that we require for all buildings? So the answer, like yes and no. So I do. Uh, it's kind of on my list of things that we want to do and how we want to keep pushing this program forward. A lot of, um, you know, a lot of our business is subsidized and they have these, the IP&As um, attached to them as a requirement from the subsidy provider, but studying kind of the work that we've done over the last few years and seeing who's not collected in the sustainability and energy efficiency loan pool, it's, it's smaller buildings, it's, you know, um, independently owned and managed, um, less experienced building owners, and I think there's a lot that we can do um, 
for those borrowers and for that line of business, especially like kind of along the lines of having some kind of a standards list that buildings need to apply to. I think that since you know we're all among friends, there's it's just kind of a challenge that we've we've seen is requiring being a tiny little bank requiring something is is a really hard thing to execute on. Um, being the only the only person in the pool requiring an initial report or additional X, Y, and Z um, is not really that wasn't that successful of a model for us. And we definitely have looked we've done that in the past. And so that's why we're kind of more focused on having these, like having conversations, presenting really great information and as much resources as we can, as we can, um, using what we, using the tools that are given to us, and that's you know, benchmarking and the IPNAs to the best of our, um, to our advantage, um, and kind of using what we got, being a little scrappy about it. Okay. Um, I think we can probably take one more question if anyone has one, but I did want to wrap up, and Irina, you can jump in here if you want to, but we have two more webinars in this underwriting efficiency series, building efficiency, really talking about measures that work for affordable housing and how to integrate them into a financing, um, into building, you know, refinance, so that's on November 8th, um, integrating efficiency, talking more about the kind of business, the process as a lender, and from origination to servicing and asset management, what kind of due diligence can you do and resources do you need um, to, to, make, to make this happen? Um, and if you have more questions, you can reach out to Irina, who is our host. And thank you so much, Irina, for having us on and making this all possible, and Bettina, too, from NRDC. Um, I'm Elizabeth, my email is up here, um, we're happy to answer more questions. Uh, I do encourage everybody to go onto our website and download the Underwriting Efficiency Handbook and dig in a little bit more, I think more of your questions will be answered in there. And um, if you are really excited about this and um, want to kind of bring this back to your organization and see it in reality um, at your institution, please let us know because we are, um, I think there's resources available to really help with that kind of technical assistance. So we're open to that. And thank you everybody for joining. Thanks everyone. Great. And thank you Elizabeth and Robert for um, for leading this session and for the, for the great work that you guys have done on this topic. Um, as, I, as, as Elizabeth mentioned, this will, um, we will send out a link to the recording so you can share that with colleagues and we will also be sharing out a link to register for the next webinar. So thank you all for participating and um, we hope to speak with you again at our next session. I do have a quick exit poll for anybody still on the line that um, we're gonna throw up on the screen. Um, there it is. So before you sign off, if you can, um, there it is, <laughs> answer the poll question, one little question, that would really help us. Um, we would appreciate your feedback. Great. And with one minute left, here are the results of that poll. And it does look like um, oh, there's uh, a lot of folks that moved up from um, I'm very new to this topic to I know a little about this or um, I understand the key concepts. So that's great feedback. And again, if you have other thoughts or questions, please feel free to reach out to myself um, representing the CDFI Learning Network or Elizabeth directly regarding the underwriting efficiency handbook. Thank you all.